Welcome to the Wilderness Season Podcast. I'm your host, Sherry Ward. I have a passion to bring hope and breakthrough to those experiencing the toughest times of their lives. In this podcast, we will give you critical insights and revelations as I interview people just like you, those who have been right where you are and understand exactly what a wilderness season is all about. It's real, it's raw, it's practical. Come join the conversation. Welcome to the Wilderness Season Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Wilderness Season Podcast. I'm your host, Sherry Ward, and with me is my co-host, Rob Miner. Hey, Rob. Hey, Sherry. Good to see you again. Yeah. Today, what we're going to talk about is when others get their breakthrough first. So I know. What a fun topic. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I call it the party pooper episode. Oh, man. (laughs) somebody else got the breakthrough and i'm still (laughs) waiting in this wilderness season what's wrong that's a hard one i that was very challenging but i think it shows your heart where your heart's at as well and i had to purposely celebrate other people's wins when i was just like win lord when when is it going to be my turn and i had to like push that aside focus on them and just celebrate their wins with them. Uh, Did you feel the same way in your wilderness? Oh yeah, no doubt. No doubt. I mean, I continue to experience this. I I literally (laughs) just experienced this over the last 48 hours. I don't know how much you want me to uh, divulge, but uh, yeah. Divulge. divulge. How about, how do you guys feel? Let's divulge. (laughs) But I can tell you, I'm responding different now than I did say two, three years ago. Yeah. Um, So anyone who listened to the second episode when I shared my testimony uh, would remember that, um, you know, a a big part of my walk with God these last 24 years has related to uh, the promise of relationship. Um, My mom divorced my dad when I was nine uh, went through a lot of broken relationships, uh, in my teens and early twenties. Uh, and I got married at the age of 29 and, and, you know, it seemed like it was ordained from heaven and that ended up going sour. And so my journey since my divorce of believing God for relationship has, has been a challenge because I, I have had some that looked very promising and, yeah. and they fell apart. And particularly as you get closer to what you call your, you know, your metaphorical promised land. And you're like, well, it has to happen now because this is, this is the Kairos moment. I mean, the <laughs> it has to just open and are beaming down on uh, me. This is clear, yeah. <laughs> clearly is it. Uh, so um, I've been seeing someone for about two months. And uh, this weekend um, I was at a, party with, uh, it was a friend of mine who was having her, her home, housewarming party. She had just uh, bought a home and moved into her new home and, yeah. and I hadn't seen my, my best friend in, in uh, about six or seven weeks. The last time we talked, um, he was in a new relationship, but I hadn't met her yet. So he showed up with this gal and uh, she was amazing. I mean, they just looked so happy together. And, and I, I genuinely was very happy for him. Um, and so we made plans to get coffee this weekend and, and, you know, he would share about his relationship experience and I would share about my relationship experience. Well, today, my relationship experience just broke it off. (laughs) I got to practice that today, which is perfect, right? I mean, that for, for all of our listeners out there who, uh, need something to relate to. Uh, this this relational experience is fresh out of the oven. I, I can relate to this uh, topic uh, very well right now. Actually, I could, and it kind of surprised me because I know this sounds funny, but I thought I was past it. You know what I mean? But it came back up again. And, you know, somebody was talking all about the favor. You know, we, we talk a lot about that in church of the favor. I've got the favor of the Lord. And God's blessing me with this and blessing me with that. And it's a lot of material things, you know, a lot of times. And 
it's just like, God, I've been what I think faithful for so many years and I'm not seeing that. And he's really been in these really rich times with me in the morning, talking to me about the prodigal son and the elder son. And he said, you're the elder son. And he said, you have everything this entire time that I have. Mm -hmm. You have everything. So even though you see the, you know, the big party and the ring on the finger and the mat, you know, the robe and the sandals and you name it, mm -hmm. you have everything. And then I started digging deep on that, um, about the elder son in the Jewish community and the elder son got the blessing and the birthright and they're two separate things. Mm -hmm. And one of them means that it gets the land. And one of them is the, uh, other things as well. But the interesting thing about that is he, that elder son would have had two thirds of everything. Mm -hmm. And the younger son only gets a third. Mm -hmm. So the reason why the older son gets more is because he has to take care of the widows and the unmarried women of the tribe. Uh, so he, he gets the land. He has to take care of these other women. And then as part of the birthright and the blessing, he gets also to be leader of the tribe. So he's the leader. So it, it was just so much more than a, than a part a one time party and some sandals on your shoes, you know, and I, and I know I'm kind of diminishing that. But God was really stressing to me this last week of you have everything. And the way that he said it was everything. And that's been haunting me. It's like, okay, God, what is, it, what is everything? <laughs> is it really everything? And how do I walk in that? You know? Right. It goes back to that, my analogy of the icing on the cake, where when you have a really good cake, it's pretty darn good without the icing. Yeah. Um, you know, I really have come to the point where I can celebrate with my friends victory or breakthrough while mine falls apart because, you know, it's partly character development. It's partly yeah. learning to, you know, not my will, but your will be done. But it's, it's more than that. It's, you know, you, you reach a point where you've, you've exercised the word of God enough where you, you really believe it. Like God's ways are higher than mine. He's working all things for good. He's got something better for me. I'm whole and complete now. Uh, does it sting? Yeah, a little bit. Um, is it disappointing? A little bit, but in the same respect, you know, you just, you learn to brush up the dust. You learn, first of all, going back to what you said about favor, Mm -hmm. I think one thing you learn when friends or people around you get breakthroughs while you're still waiting on yours, it reinforces that everything we receive, we receive by grace anyway. Like my friend is not more righteous. He hasn't walked the walk better than me. He's not getting rewarded and I'm not. That's, that's not right. It it's his time. It's not my time yet. Right. I think that favor, he's really, he went from a whole week of the prodigal son with me and the elder son and telling me I'm the older son to talking to me about favor because so much time, so many times in the church, it's like, oh, I've got the favor of the Lord. I've got this, I've got that. And what he started to show me, because right now I'm in a season of who's going to be on my ship and who's not going to be on my ship. And God says, it's equally as important as who you attract as who you repel right now. And that was like a new thing for me because, you know, in the Christian community, it's like love, love everybody. And everybody's supposed to be on your ship and all of that. And then he took me back to Jesus when Jesus said, you know, eat my blood or eat my body and drink my blood. And half the disciples or more walked away. And, and I felt like God was saying to me personally in my time with him, you know, everybody looks at that as a bad thing. And it was because his heart was for those people. But Jesus only had three years to do what he needed to do. And he needed to be with people that wanted to be on his boat and that, you know, were truly followers and was 
ready to give it all up for him. So he was teaching me a lot about favor. He was teaching me a lot about uh, attracting people and repelling people and letting people go in my life that I need to let go of. And that's a hard thing for me to mm -hmm. let go because it's like, I care so much that I don't want to let anybody go. But, and then he also said, I'm going to close it out with this thought that favor is not attached to a person. So it's not like, Oh, well, this person has all these contacts or this person has this, they could bring me, or this person has that. And if, they go, then I lose all that. It's like, no, no, no. The favor is not that person. I give you favor. It's, it's coming from me, not the person or not the thing or whatever it is. So that's, that's been this last week for me is, is relearning or kind of at a 2.0 level of just really being the older son and knowing that I have everything. And it's okay when other people get blessed and all that. Cause that's an orphan mentality anyway. Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, that's what it comes down to. I, I give you a biblical example. Uh, if you ever feel like you, uh, you know, someone's getting their ticket before you and you've seen this pattern re repeat itself several times and you're wondering when is my name going to be called? Uh, just be encouraged by the story of Rachel. Rachel uh, saw her sister mm, and her good. two concubines give Jacob nine sons before God gave her Joseph. Oh, that's good. And it's important to note that Joseph was the chosen one. So not only did she not do any, something wrong, not only was her sister more favored than her, um, it was actually the long obnoxious waiting yeah, that was the testament that she was indeed, you know, the woman of promise that Joseph was the child of promise. So sometimes the waiting doesn't mean we're doing something wrong. It could actually indicate that what God has in store is so significant that this obnoxious waiting is part of the journey. I agree with that. That's really good. And I think you have to be careful of what you call favor because we could have easily said, oh, they were super highly favored and they were, but that doesn't mean she wasn't because her role and what she brought to the table saved nations with an S, you know, not just Egypt, not just anything else. It saved the whole known world at that time what she brought to the table and what she brought into this world through Joseph. And I, I really have come to believe that a part of my future calling is related to this idea of wholeness of seeking first the kingdom and all these things will be given as well. Um, you know, relationship was an idol for me for most of my adult life. Um, you know, I said my mom left when, uh, or she divorced my dad when I was nine, um, had a lot of relational issues after that. And so this thing that was perpetually just outside my grasp became something, this idea that, you know, if, if this is what I had, then I would truly be happy. And so, you know, to, to reach this point where you really become fulfilled, uh, and I'm not just talking about relationship. I'm talking about, you know, with work, with ministry. I've seen this in all sorts of things where mm -hmm. the things that you hope for fall apart. And little by little, it, the, the resistance training reinforces this idea that I am whole and complete within myself. I have truly become a content individual so that nothing really phases me a whole lot. I've been phased so many times. It's like I've now become a resistant. Wait a minute. Is it phased or tased? I don't know. I feel tased a lot. So, but I, you know, I think going back to the story of, of Rachel, you know, her waiting was part of her destiny. It was, it was this idea that Joseph was the chosen one. And my waiting has served the purpose of 
not only whatever relationship God brings me in, not only will it be a strong foundation that's not easily shaken uh, or that needs to be codependent on mm -hmm. another person to have that satisfaction in life, yeah. but now that becomes my authority in ministry to help others who are going through the same struggle. So unpack the authority, because I think that's a big piece of it too, through the waiting and through the championing others, well, we have yet to see the victory, so to speak, or the favor. Right. You know, I don't know if even if I want to call it a victory or a favor, none of those sound right. But as we're in the wait, mm -hmm. we're building the character to get the authority through that. Yeah more like we're we're you know again back that scripture of romans 5 well that was the last podcast we talked about this but uh romans 5 talks about these trials or the suffering produces perseverance perseverance develops character yeah. character yeah. develops hope and i would say that that begets authority mm. because the things that we overcome you know our suffering results I don't want to say all suffering results from wounding, but wounding exasperates our pain. Yeah. And so our suffering produces perseverance. We learn to just get up and keep going, to keep anchoring into the Lord each day, to keep confessing his word. That develops character. Mm -hmm. Character. Another way I would say, another way of saying character is uh, when you stop leaking, I know you kept saying that. I'm like, what does that mean? You stop leaking. I'm like, what? You gotta go to the bathroom or what? <laughs> I used to leak like no one's business. You know, some days I'd be leaking depression. The other days I'm leaking fear. Other days, insecurity, anxiety. You know, little by little, you just stop leaking so much. You're filling up the holes in your bucket, huh? You're filling up the holes, which, which, you know, if you're all patched up, so to speak, you're now whole. Mm -hmm. because you're not leaking and if i'm <laughs> whole then i can live off hope yeah I, hope is the gasoline that runs my car because i don't need these physical circumstances to dictate to fill what's already full mm, that's because good. i've learned to live by god's word mm -hmm. that's why i'm all patched up that's why i don't leak anymore right Right. Man does not live on bare alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, right. um, so then our authority comes from that because when we have overcome something in particular in our life where we've been patched up and we're now whole where we were once incomplete, leaking, yeah. wounded, we now have the authority to help others in that area because we've, we've overcome that. Yeah, I think what you overcome, you have you carry that authority, definitely. And I remember a lot of times the Lord telling me, would you really feel this way, like being left out or not being called on or next in line, however you wanna say it, would you really, really feel that way if tomorrow you had the breakthrough that you're standing on? Could you celebrate him then? I mean, he's, he really challenges me, you know, it's like, could you celebrate him then if tomorrow you knew the whole thing was going to turn around for you? It's like, no, it'd be easy. And it's like, okay, then that's what you need to do. That's what you need to do. That's what you need to do. You need to celebrate them. That, that goes back to, you know, how did Jesus get out of the wilderness in 40 days? He, he went back to the lesson in Deuteronomy when Moses said, you know, he's talking about the lesson of the man in the wilderness. He says, you know, God has done this so that man would learn that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Yeah. And there were and so, many, there were, go ahead, I'm sorry. So I was going to say, you know, when we live from this mentality that all of God's promises are yes and amen, then when we have a disappointment, when something falls to the ground, I mean, we always have a choice. Every day, faith is a choice. I can choose to go, oh, God, why? But, it, you know, 
is one thing the wilderness does. It's like you bang your head against the wall so many times that you just learn to stop doing that. Banging your head. And and then, you know, when, when you, you reach a point where you've practiced God's word enough, where it's almost instinct, where it's like, God is good, God is faithful, God has something up his sleeve, and you brush off the dust. And uh, so from that place, God's word has more substance than the disappointment that's staring you in the face. Say that again. That was good. You can reach a point where God's promise has more substance than the disappointment staring you in the face. That's so good. That's um, really good. If you don't mind, maybe I can indulge a little bit further on that. Yeah, go for it. You know, I said that faith is a choice. I, I had an experience a few years ago. This is probably one of the most significant conversations I've had in many years. This, this amazing woman of faith. And I remember she said something that stuck, like a <laughs> splinter that you can't get out. Wow. She said, I just reached a point where I decided I'm going to trust God. So help me, God. Mm. That's good, too. And up until that point, it's like I understood that at some level, but at some level, I'm like, no, nah, it's not that simple. And she's like, no, it's that simple. And there was something about, it's like she had the authority to say that because she had come to the point where she actually lived that. That's awesome. Yeah, awesome. You know, I, I think partly the reason I can say what I say is because I've practiced this enough where, yeah, you, you, trust is a choice. Like I could say, God, this is like the 12th time this has happened. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah, yeah, is yeah, like yeah. this endless cycle that it, stop. Just stop. Just, you know, you reach a point you're like not going there. Yeah. yeah. And it's easy because you've practiced it enough that, you know, it's in you. I totally agree with that. And I think for me too, I really practiced celebrating them even when I didn't feel like celebrating them. And so a lot of times I'll let my words lead before and my heart will catch up. So I will say things or do things or maybe go buy him flowers or go buy him a present to celebrate the win. Mm -hmm. And I may not be 100% going yippee ki -yay. you know, that's so amazing. But my voice and my actions and my servant's heart to serve them and to give them a gift or do whatever is leading knowing that my heart will catch up and being open enough for my heart to catch up so it's not a fake and phony thing it's yeah. i'm leading with my voice i'm leading with my actions and heart catch up you know i'm going to let you catch up and being open to letting that leg behind till it comes up and i think the more that i did that then it became more natural just to be excited for people and like, yeah, good. Yay. You know, that means mine's right around the corner too. And yay, you know, um, and it, then it became more natural to do that. I mean, it's, it's just good practice. Anytime that we can interpret reality without filtering it through the lens of self, we yeah. do that instinctively, don't we? Yeah. That comparison, so thing. For, but the sucks for maybe no, it's not about you. <laughs> yeah. Just remove yourself from the filter. Yeah. Hey, I'm so happy for you. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we, we do that instinctively. It's a hard and, habit to break. And, and if you really think about that elder son, you know, he had everything the father had. And when the prodigal left, he split the land at that point. So he literally had everything the father had. They were like co-owners, I guess, at that point, whatever you want to call it, you know? So he really did have everything. And that's the mentality that um, God's really working on me for that again, which is weird because I thought, oh my gosh, I thought I learned this lesson, God, but I guess I didn't yet. Or yeah. we're going to a new level with this lesson or something, so... Because I think a lot of us are, are walking around with that orphan mentality of, you know, I'm an orphan. I don't, I don't walk in the, that fullness of everything that I have available to me. And I think it's just being hit all the time, you know, in the wilderness, it's, 
you're being plummeted. It's like wave after wave after wave. And after a while, it's like, oh my gosh, when is this ever going to stop? You know, and then when somebody else is like walking on water and you're getting hit, Mm -hmm. it's a big disparity sometimes. You know, the difference between, you know, them with their miracle walking on water and you're just like, okay, I just need a life preserver to float on the top, you know, let alone walk. Yeah, and what I do want to reinforce is that, you know, I remember being in the wilderness. I remember being in that place where I'm like, I'm never going to reach that point. Like, wait, which you, point? Well, let's say, for example, that me in 2017 was watching this podcast right now. <laughs> and it wasn't me talking, it was some other slow Joe, I don't know, worth Adam. But yeah. the exact same words, I'd, I'd probably have a hard time hearing it because I'd be like, I'm going to be 82 by the time I master this test. No, you're not going to be 82 by the time you master <laughs> this test. Uh, w- when you're in the thick of it, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm screwed. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But this is why I talk about the passive night of the soul a lot. In the passive night of the soul, God is at work. It's kind of like someone who's in surgery. You know, mm. what, what do you do to heal yourself when you are being operated on? You nothing. do nothing. nothing. You can't do anything if you tried because you are asleep. You can't even wake up. And it's important to understand that. Like, if you ask me, how did I get to where I was three years ago to where I am now? I'd be like, beats the... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I say that I've practiced standing on God's word enough. So that's what I mean by the act of the soul. In other words, there's things that I have done. Right. But like, I wouldn't tell you, oh, you got to do A, B, or C. I'm doing A, B, or C because God did such a work in me that it's just what I naturally, how I naturally evolved spiritually. Right. I want to make sure we we put the emphasis on God, not on the individual, because when we when we focus on ourselves, we're like, I'm never going to get there. No, you will. Because he's the Lord of this process. Yeah. And he's going to finish what he started. I like that. So I've got, you know, me and my scriptures, you you have a memorized. I just write them down. So. (laughs) So Psalm 27, 13 says, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That's my favorite part. I kept going, okay, I can't die because it's the land of the living that I'm going to see your goodness. And that was one of the scriptures that I kept going back to that I would have lost heart, but I'm not going to because I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, which means I'm going to be alive when I see all of this come out and, you know, get to the other side. And I think I've said this before, but I had to come to the point of just totally giving up control, saying, I will be here as long as it takes to get out of me everything that needs to get out of me in order for me to enter the promised land and to take it. And, you know, there's one thing to take the promised land. It's another thing to occupy it. And that's that authority that we've built up in that wilderness. Mm -hmm. And part of that is celebrating others because if you're going to lead other people you've got to celebrate them you've got to get behind them you've got to back them that's that's part of being a really good leader yeah right and it's hard to celebrate people when you're fixated on yourself or the pity parties or the the orphan stuff and 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 you know we always got something going on maybe you know, we don't have a uh, relationship fall apart every day, but there's always something going on, uh, or at least something that happened two, three days ago that we could potentially still be distracted by. Yeah. So, you know, all these, it's just good to see it as opportunities. I remember, I think it was Graham Cook, but I don't know this for certain, but I believe it was Graham Cook who said, when we get to heaven, we're not going to have any more opportunities to praise God in our sufferings, in our disappointment, 
in our confusion and our frustration. Mm -hmm. We have such, a, you know, this life is a blink of an eye, as Paul said, in, in contrast to eternity. When we get to heaven, we are going to look back at these times. And I think one of our greatest regrets is failed opportunities. Mm. Fail, failed opportunities to seize those moments. So let me give you another example. It seems completely different, but it's, it's the same idea. Okay. This morning, I felt disoriented. I'm like, I'm confused, God. I don't know what you're doing. I don't understand. And I just said, well, I'll give you the one thing that I can do. And I started speaking in tongues. Mm. <laughs> And I didn't even think I sounded foolish anymore. I'm just like, this is all I have to give you. Like, I'm confused, I'm disoriented, and I'm just going to completely surrender my mind to you until the spirit starts to reverberate. And now I start to see clearly, I start to uh, feel hope rise up again, and now I can have a coherent relationship conversation with you, God. That's awesome. So, um, you know, every difficult time is an opportunity to say, okay, God, I feel this. I see this. I could get disappointed. I could complain. <laughs> I could go, this is the 12th time. I could do that. Yeah. Or I could choose to praise you. I could choose to stand on your word. I can choose to be an overcomer here. And I think the bottom line is, do you trust God? Do you trust God with your own life? Your life may not look like somebody else's. They may be getting all these things, you know, but do you trust him? And, and I've said this before, the biggest thing that he honed in on me and he still hones on in on this today in my life is, do you trust me? Do you trust me? Do you trust me? Do you trust me? And then he does all these different sayings with the word trust, you know, Trust will hear your broken heart. You know, trust is the key that unlocks every door. Trust will is the door that unlocks the golden door. It's like all this stuff, you know, but it's all trust because if we fully, fully trust him and not just a Christianese platitude, but if we put all of our trust in him, it doesn't matter what the person next to us does, doesn't do, gets, doesn't get, it just doesn't matter because we trust God that we're in our lane and that our lane that we're running looks different for the very fact that we're in a different lane. We're in a different, we're each in a, our lane and we're running the race, but each of our lanes are completely different. So of course it's going to show up different. Of course it's going to look completely different the way that they get things and you get something. Cause like one person may want the designer bag and the other person may want the designer house, you know, like even what they want is different, sure. you know? And so what you're asking for and believing for are different, you know? And trust is a muscle, you know, like everything else, it comes with exercise. Yeah. And so, you know, like when this happened to me today, you know, when, she got back to me and it was not what I expected. You know, I've just learned my first response is, okay, God, your ways are higher than my ways. I don't understand this, but I trust your ways are higher than my ways. Yeah. I'm confused. This wasn't the response I'm looking for, but trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will make your path straight. And so, you know, every time where you have an opportunity to choose distrust which comes in the form of complaint or falling into depression you know your pity party whatever it is when you build the exercise of trying to him and say no it's okay if i feel sad but i'm going to choose to stand on the butt god yeah <laughs> And, and stand with him through this disappointment. And I would, again, I, you know, I always lead with my mouth and I say, I trust you. Like I have to out loud say it, even if nobody's in the room, well, most of the time, nobody is in the room. It's like, okay, God, I trust you. I trust you. And now I've been, like you said, with the sandpaper, so sanded down. It's like, okay, well, 
you got my trust. And I, and I think that when we're giving God our yes, and we're going after it with all that we have, I don't really think there is a plan B, you know, it may look like a plan B, Mm -hmm. but he's really giving us plan A. Mm -hmm. We just think it's plan B, but he's really, he's a good father. And like, like Bill Johnson always says, he's always in a good mood. So he's bringing us plan A. It just may not always look like plan A because it doesn't look like somebody else's plan A. And sometimes you're just not going to understand it. No, most of the time. Most of the time. Can we just say most of the time we don't? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, for me, I'm like, okay, well, I, I've had plan B, C, D, E, F, <laughs> L, R, Q. <laughs> I think there are two W's, you know, so it's like, uh, you know, but again, that's where you just, you receive it by faith. Because the intellectual mind kicks in and say, well, I don't know about, shh, shut it. I choose to trust God. Yeah, but I choose to trust God. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because I mean, our intellectual mind is like a dog chasing its tail. You can go around in circles till the cows come home. It can last for an hour. It can last for a year if you want to. Yeah, At some true. point, you just have to put up the stops and say, no, I'm just going to trust God. And that's the, the whole scripture everybody quotes of taking every thought captive. You're taking it captive and you're telling it no, yeah. no stay stay (laughs) sit lie down (laughs) i'm not a dog (laughs) i'm acting like one (laughs) wow stop chasing your tail i think this was a really good conversation and and i think it's one that we really needed to talk about because it's you know i think a lot of us feel that way of of what do you do when somebody has their breakthrough first and you're still waiting and it and a lot of times it's not months it's years, you know, they could get the breakthrough years before you ever do for your lane that you're running. So do you have any closing thoughts as we're wrapping this episode up? Yeah, I think it would be this. How do we define disappointment? Like, for example, I was just in a relationship for two months. I can interpret this by saying, oh man, see, it didn't happen again. What didn't happen again? In other words, if we see life as a means to an end, like I'm in this relationship because my hope is it will lead to marriage. Well, yeah, you're going to get disappointed. But if you learn to really take hold of this idea of this is the day the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad. Mm -hmm. Well, tomorrow is just as much as that this is the day the Lord has made as today was. Mm. before this disappointment happened Mm -hmm. and this might be kind of a mind job for some people like yeah but the relationship failed no no that was just part of today and then tomorrow i wake up and it's a new day and i think this is partly what was one thing god does in these seasons is is he changes the way that we interpret life yeah. Because again, if I'm already whole and complete in him, if every day is a day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad because he's in it, because every day he's doing something. Every yeah. day yeah. he's prepared that day for a purpose. There's joy. There's, there's wonderful connections. There's wonderful experiences to have. If I can embrace it as that. But, but we, we, we got to learn to let go of this means to an end thinking that even perceives disappointment as opposed to, okay, that didn't go the way I hoped, but tomorrow's a new day, period. Yeah. And also, what did I walk away with? I mean, the lessons learned and all of that as well. Right. I mean, those were two enjoyable months. I enjoyed that time and now we have you know 20 days left in march and (laughs) who knows what those 20 days hold yeah i'm not going to get stuck in the past because the past is the past and tomorrow is a new day right but i want to i want to temper that with we still need to feel the feelings you know we feel the feelings we get hurt we cry but we just don't stay there 
You know, you just have to lead with your, I, I keep saying this, but you've got to lead with your words until your heart and your soul catches up. But we're leading with our words first. You know, yes. like that would have been a lot harder if it would have been a year versus two months. Right. Oh, absolutely. But also you, you, you grieve that with the Lord. Yeah. And again, this is part of that change of perception where, like, if I'm married to the Lord, then I'm perceiving this from, like, I'm disappointed that this didn't work out, but now I'm going to my spouse. I'm going to my lover. In other words, I didn't break up. My primary relationship is still completely intact. So, yes, it still hurts. Yes, there's still disappointment. Mm -hmm. But again, it's it's that perception shift that allows you to process and move through stuff quicker that's awesome well thank you so much for sharing it's been such a good conversation and we really hope that this helped you today with just really thinking about celebrating others that even when you're in the wilderness and even when you're going through it that you just take that time to celebrate other people and their wins and that you let your voice lead and your declarations lead first and let the rest catch up. So until next time, we'll see you on the Wilderness Season Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Wilderness Season Podcast. If you need help navigating through your own wilderness season, pick up a copy of my book, A Journey Out of the Wilderness, available on Amazon. Also, continue the conversation online with us by going to our Wilderness Season Facebook page. For resources and events, you can go to www.sherrylynnward.com. If you have enjoyed this show, please subscribe and review our podcast. Just remember, you're not alone.